Okay, let's go ahead and open up to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20 tonight as we make our way through this great book of the Acts of the Apostles. And I've entitled tonight's message, Beware of Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. One of the themes here in Acts chapter 20, Beware of Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. Verse 1 says, After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, remember that Paul was there in Ephesus, and there was a great revival that was taking place in Ephesus, and people were uh, burning their uh, magic books and their spell books and their idols and so forth. There was a tremendous revival that was taking place uh, with the power uh, of the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the preaching of the gospel. And then as was common with Paul the Apostle, everywhere he went, almost everywhere he went, there would be a revival followed by a ruckus, followed by uh, just this uprising, this riot that would take place. And this is what happened there in Ephesus. We read back in Acts chapter 19 about this commotion. Acts chapter 19 and verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Now there was this great, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the temple uh, to the goddess Diana that was there in Ephesus. And it was a big moneymaker. This temple was a big moneymaker for the local merchants. It says, he called them together, uh, the workers of similar occupation, the other idol uh, makers and sellers. And he said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they had heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristocharis, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Verse 32 says, Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. And so uh, every time that you make inroads into the enemy's territory, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be opposition. We should not be afraid of the enemy. A greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And Jesus has given us that authority here on the earth. And so we don't have to fear the enemy, but we must have a healthy respect for the enemy. He has a lot of power. He has a lot of people on his side. And we have to understand that opposition is expected. It's found throughout the scriptures. Whenever God is doing a work, the enemy tries to oppose that work. And this is what we see happening time and time again in the book of Acts right from the very beginning. So Paul here now is leaving Ephesus. Again, after the uproar had ceased, when things finally quieted down, Paul called the disciples to himself. He embraced them and he departed to go to Macedonia. Now, I don't know, Rich, do we still have our little map that we can put up behind me here? And you guys can kind of get an idea of where Paul is traveling to today. He's in Ephesus in uh, Asia Minor, the um, western part of Turkey. And he is leaving Ephesus to head back over to Macedonia. There we go. On the other side of the Aegean Sea. So you have Miletus, you have Ephesus, you have Smyrna, you have Pergamum. This is all part of Asia Minor, ancient Asia Minor, uh, and also modern-day Turkey. He's going back across uh, the Aegean Sea, and he's going to go back over to Europe, back over to Macedonia, the area 
uh, of mainland Greece. This is where the cities of Philippi and Thessalonica are found, and Paul is retracing some of his steps where uh, he had planted churches uh, earlier in his ministry. Verse 2, now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece, and he stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And so what happened was is the word had gotten out there uh, likely in the area of Corinth, although it's not mentioned by name. Most Bible scholars believe the three months that Paul spent there uh, in this area uh, of Macedonia that he was actually in, uh, in Corinth. It's the area of Acacia also. And there was a J Jewish community in Corinth that just absolutely despised Paul. They hated him uh, uh, completely, and, and, and they wanted to kill him. And so while Paul was there in Europe, in this area of Macedonia, Corinth, Acacia, Greece, uh, the, the European continent, there was a plot that Paul was made aware of that basically he was going to travel. He wanted to get back to Jerusalem, so he was going to travel back across the Aegean Sea on a straight shot over to Syria so that from Syria uh, and Antioch he could head back down south to Jerusalem to make it for the Passover festival. But when he found that uh, there was this plot against him, he decided to go a different route. He decided to return back through Macedonia. And so what he did is he kept closer to the coastline there uh, and made his way back kind of the long way around instead of taking the straight shot. Because what, what probably would have happened, uh, there were many Jewish pilgrims in this area. They would have traveled uh, all together by boat in order to go to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover, is that these guys would have just grabbed Paul and thrown him overboard in the middle of the night and nobody would have ever heard from Paul again. I mean, they were constantly trying to kill him. And uh, so Paul, uh, using uh, you know, wisdom, decided not to take the chance, and instead he uh, took kind of the long way around, and he uh, decided to return through the area of Macedonia. Verse 4 says, And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia. So he's coming back from Europe, the European continent, back to the Asian continent, which they call Asia. It's, again, modern-day Turkey. Also, Erastacrus and Segundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. And so he's making his way back through some of the areas that he had previously been and some of the uh, disciples are traveling with him. Timothy here is mentioned again, the young pastor Timothy, uh, who is from the area of Lystra, from the area of Derby, who had been traveling with Paul and Paul uh, had left him there. Uh, uh, when, when he went over to Ephesus, he left him in the area of Corinth, and now they're reconnecting again, and Paul is going to try and head back to Jerusalem to make it for uh, the Feast of uh, uh, Pentecost, 50 days after uh, the festival of Passover and Unleavened Bread. It's interesting, you see this name, Tychicus here, very unusual name. We actually have a young man in our church, I don't see his parents here today, but T. and Darwin's son whose name is Ty, we call him Ty, his real name is Tychicus, his, uh, his full name is Tychicus, uh, uh, named after this disciple here in Acts chapter 20 uh, and verse 4. So next time you see Ty, make sure you call him by his full name. I always call him Tychicus, I don't call him Ty, I, I call him Tychicus because it's such a full Greek Bible name uh, right here from Acts chapter 20, I think it's a great name. Verse 5, these men going ahead waited for us at Troas. So now we have the first person plural pronoun being used again, us, as Luke, the author of this uh, book, is now once again a traveling companion with Paul. And, and we have mentioned that uh, throughout the book of Acts that there are times when Luke is traveling with Paul and he said, we'll say, we went here and we went there and us you know, uh, uh, they went with us, not just with them. Uh, and then there's other times where he's not there with them. Uh, and so he is reconnecting here at this point uh, with Paul the Apostle. He likely rejoined Paul in Philippi. So these men going ahead waited for us at Troas, verse 6, but we sailed away from Philippi. So no doubt Luke reconnected with Paul at Philippi. 
after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So I'm not going to go into all of the details of where all these seaports are and the, the, you know, these cities are, because quite frankly, it, it's really not relevant to the rest of the story here. But they're just making their way back to uh, Jerusalem. He wants to make it back to Jerusalem, as every Jewish male who was 20 years and older was required to go to Jerusalem uh, for at least one of the three major festivals, the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread uh, in April, the April time frame, uh, or, and or the Feast of Pentecost 50 days after Passover, which was in early June, uh, and or the Feast of Tabernacles, Yom Kippur, which is in the fall in September. And every Jewish male who lived within a walking distance or could get on a mule or ride a mule, they had to be there. Every Jewish man, 20 years and older, had to go to those three festivals every year. But if you lived far away, you didn't have to come because it would be very, very difficult. It would be a, a, a tremendous amount of time, travel time, uh, to, to make your way from one part of the Roman Empire or, 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 or Greece over to uh, Jerusalem. So they were required only to go one time a year uh, for the festival. And so uh, Paul is trying to make it there in time for the Feast of Pentecost. Verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, this is a Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So this is one of the examples in the scriptures in the New Testament where we are told that the, the church met on Sunday. The church met on Sunday. I challenge you to find one example in the New Testament that were required and demanded and commanded to worship on the Sabbath. You won't find it. I challenge you to find one time where the church actually gathered together and broke bread and had a church service on a Sabbath day. It doesn't exist because the church did not meet on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was at the synagogue for the Jews. The church met on Sunday, every time, all the time, the first day of the week. Contrary to what the Seventh-day Adventists say and uh, the uh, uh, Seventh-day Baptists and uh, some of the other uh, cults that are out there that require that you must worship on Saturday, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath day, or uh, you're not going to go uh, to heaven. That is what their theology states. But here is one example among many where we see that they met on the first day of the week, that is Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread. So that was to share in the Lord's table or break bread to have food, but also likely speaking of having communion and the memorial of the, the bread uh, and the grape juice uh, as Christ commanded, do this in remembrance of me. We know that Jesus was raised on a Sunday. He wasn't raised on a Saturday. His body was still in the grave in the tomb on a Saturday. He was raised in, in, before the sun rose on that Sunday morning. We know that Pentecost, the birthday of the church, where the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost took place 50 days after Passover. Penta means 5 or 50. And it was 50 days after Passover where the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. And it happened on a Sunday. So the birthday of a church was on a Sunday, on Pentecost. The uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ was on a Sunday. We see here in the book of Acts recorded that they met together as believers and broke bread together on a Sunday. Again, I challenge you, you won't find it because I've looked. There are no examples that I've ever found in the scriptures that the early church met on Shabbat or on the Sabbath day. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul the Apostle, uh, in writing to the church in Corinth, tells them this. In verse 1, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. So as Paul is writing a letter to the church in Corinth, the church in Corinth, they were gathering together on Sundays, on the first day of the week. So Paul says, when you guys get together for your next church service, 
uh, make sure that you take up a collection for the saints that are in, the poor saints that are there in in Jerusalem. So again, the church is not saved by the keeping of the law. We've looked at that uh, many, many times in this Acts study. We are not required to keep the Mosaic law. We are not required to circumcise our males. We are not required to eat a kosher diet. And we are not required to meet on the Sabbath day. We are not under the law. We are under grace. God made many covenants with his people uh, throughout the beginning of of his relationship with mankind. Uh, The first covenant was the covenant that he made with Noah, that he was no longer in Genesis chapter 9, that he was no longer ever going to flood the whole earth and cover it with water again. And then the sign of the covenant with Noah was the rainbow in the sky. Uh, With Abraham, God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Uh, in Genesis chapter 17. This is the Abrahamic covenant. The uh, Noahic covenant was the, uh, uh, the rainbow covenant that God was not going to flood the earth with water again. Uh, the covenant with Abraham, God said this in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly so god is going to make a covenant with abraham who is the father of the faith and who is uh, the father of the jewish people he says in verse 7 i will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be god to you and your descendants after you Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And the Jews are still there, back in their homeland today, 4,000 years after God made this promise, because it's a promise of God. The land of Israel belongs to the Jews, to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as an everlasting covenant. He says, I give you and your descendants, uh, he says in verse 9, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And we looked at at this in in some detail uh, earlier in this Acts chapter study. I encourage you to go back and listen to the messages, especially from Acts chapter 15, when we were dealing with the fact that that the uh, early church leaders determined that they were not going to require the Gentile males to be circumcised. This was for Israel. This was a covenant between God and uh, Israel. There is also the Mosaic covenant that God made with Moses, again, for the children of Israel. And we read in Exodus chapter 31 that the Sabbath day was part of the covenant for the children of Israel. Exodus 31 and verse 12. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths shall you keep, for it is a sign between me and you, Israel, Throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Verse 17, it is a sign between me and whom? The children of Israel, not the church, the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments, is for Israel. God makes it very clear. He clearly defines it. It's not for everybody. It's not for the Gentile members of the church. This is for the nation and the people of Israel, even as the circumcision of the flesh was for the children of Israel. And so we are not under this covenant. We are under the new covenant. These are the old covenants of the law. 
the, the, the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. We're not under the covenant of the law. We are under the covenant of grace, the new covenant. You know, it's, it's interesting that the Jews today uh, that are Orthodox, or, or when we go to Israel, we'll see that on the Sabbath day, especially in Jerusalem, everything shuts down. They will not drive a car. An Orthodox Jew will not drive a car on the Sabbath because part of the Sabbath laws is that you're not to light a fire. And they say when you turn on the ignition switch and you, you know, fire up that engine, literally you're causing a fire in the engine and therefore you're kindling a fire. Therefore, you cannot drive your car on the Sabbath day. They will not turn on light switches in their homes. They have them all on sensors that turn on automatically, actually. I've been in an elevator on Shabbat in uh, the, one of the hotels in the Dead Sea, and they will not allow you to push the button of the elevator. So what the elevator does on Shabbat is it stops at every floor. No one's allowed to push a button because then perhaps you're working by pushing the button on the Sabbath day. You weren't allowed to walk more than two-thirds of a mile uh, on the Sabbath day. So again, so if the Seventh-day Adventists want to go all the way with keeping the Sabbath day, they can't drive their cars on the Sabbath day. They can't turn on their light switches on the Sabbath day. And they can't walk more than two-thirds of a mile if they really want to put themselves under the Mosaic law of Sabbath day worship. But thank the Lord, we are not justified by the keeping of the law. We're justified by grace. We're saved by grace. We don't have to keep the Sabbath day. If you want to worship on the Sabbath day, you're free to do so. But you are not mandated or required to do so. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul the Apostle says this. A church in Galatia that was uh, legalism was beginning to creep into the church. Paul said, stand fast, Galatians 5.1. Therefore... In the liberty which Christ has made us free, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. If you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. In other words, you can't go back to the keeping of the law and think that somehow you're going to be saved or you're going to be favored. Or you're going to earn brownie points by keeping the law. As a matter of fact, Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10, for as many are as of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So basically, if you want to be saved by worshiping on the Sabbath, you've got to go back to the Old Testament and you have to do all the laws of the Old Testament all the time. And you can't do it. Nobody can. The Jews couldn't do it either. And so uh, he says, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So don't even start trying to have a legal relationship with God. If you wanted to have a legal relationship with God, then you have fallen from grace, according to Paul the Apostle. In the book of Colossians, Paul tells us this, that we, uh, that basically all of the uh, festivals and the feast days and, and the Sabbaths and, and the new moons, etc., that they were a shadow of things to come. In Colossians 2, verse 16, so let no one judge you in food or in drink. In other words, let no one judge you based on dietary laws or regarding a festival or a feast day or a new moon or Sabbaths, worshiping on the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Paul's saying all of that was pointing us to Jesus. And Jesus is our Shabbat. He is our Sabbath rest. We're at rest from having to work the works of the law in order to have right standing before God. So we're not to uh, be judged uh, based on, on the Mosaic law or circumcision or uh, kosher diet uh, food, uh, you know, or, or, or worshiping on the Sabbath day. One more scripture about this. Paul says in Romans 14 and verse 4 about the Sabbath day. 
He says, who are you to judge another one's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will make him to stand, or uh, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him to stand. Romans 14, 5, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, like the Sabbath day. He who does not observe the day, or the Sabbath day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. He who gives God thanks, and he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and he gives God thanks, for none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. So Paul says one man esteems one day above another, another man esteems every day alike. We are not under the law. We are not required to worship on the Sabbath day. And again, I feel so sorry for the Seventh-day Adventists who put themselves under this yoke of bondage because it's not necessary. We're not required uh, to continue to keep the law of Moses. And again, you want to start with the Sabbath day. You can't stop there. You have to go with all of it. And uh, quite frankly, no one except for Jesus Christ has been able to keep the law fully because we are all sinners. Even Paul says the law ended up uh, killing him because he thought he kept all the law, but he broke the 10th commandment, which was thou shalt not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's donkey or your neighbor's house or anything that your neighbor has. And Paul says, that's the one that got me. He thought he kept all the other nine commandments, but he failed in his coveting or his envy or his jealousy uh, of what someone else had that he had wanted. Again, we are under the new covenant. The new covenant uh, was taught by Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 36. It was taught uh, and revealed uh, by Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. The Lord says this, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. It is by grace. The just shall live by faith. It's in faith in Jesus Christ and it's by the grace of God that our sins are forgiven. Not by any good works that we could do. Uh, certainly not by worshiping on the Sabbath day or uh, get circumcising our males or eating a kosher diet. None of that can save us. None of that get, brings us any closer uh, to God. In the book of Hebrews, we're told in Hebrews chapter 8 that this new covenant was uh, initiated by Jesus Christ and that we are now in the new covenant. We're not part of the old covenant of the law. We're in the new covenant uh, by grace. Hebrews 8 verse 7, for if that first covenant, the covenant under the law, had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And then he goes on to quote what we just read in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Verse 13 of Hebrews 8, the author of Hebrews says this, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. We're, we're, we're done with the old covenant, guys. We're not saved by keeping the law, any of it or all of it. Now, we should be good citizens. We should be those who seek to, uh, you know, keep the Ten Commandments to the best of our ability. But you're not going to get to heaven by the keeping of the Ten Commandments you're, you're, because you're not going to be able to do it. And, and the Sabbath day for us, we choose Sunday, the first day of the week, the day that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, Easter Sunday, the day of the uh, birthday of the church, which is the day of Pentecost, was a Sunday. We see 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, take up an offering when you gather together on a Sunday. Here in Acts chapter 20, we see they gathered together to break bread on a Sunday. So to us, we treat Sunday as that sacred day, that day that we set aside uh, for God. 
And uh, really, every day should be a day that we uh, sanctify unto the Lord as his people. Not just, even not just on Sundays. Here we are on Wednesday nights. We're sanctifying here Wednesday nights uh, to uh, draw close to the Lord and to seek the Lord. So Paul continue, or we continue reading about Paul's journey here in Acts chapter 20 and verse 8. So they had gathered together on the first day of the week, verse 7. Paul was getting ready to depart the next day. He spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Paul was uh, going long. He was waxing eloquent. You think I go long sometimes. Paul went on for hours and hours over the time when they probably thought he was supposed to be done. So it says there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. And he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, before you're too hard on this young man, uh, uh, Eutychus, who was there to hear Paul, Paul was going on for hours and hours and hours teaching. Uh, he was up at the very top of, uh, of the building, uh, the third floor, sitting in a window, no doubt, to try and get some air because it was nighttime. They were going all the way till midnight, so they had torches burning. The torches are going to put out fumes, and those fumes are going to begin to accumulate at, at the ceiling on, on the top floor, the third floor, where this young man was, and no doubt, he just, he just could not keep his eyes open, and he, he fell into a deep sleep. He literally passed out, and he fell out of the window, and, and he died. He was taken up dead. Verse 10, but Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. So Paul resurrected this young man or Jesus through Paul resurrected this young man from the dead. And so we see that Paul uh, even had uh, that power of Jesus Christ at work in him, the power to resurrect the dead. Verse 13. Then we went ahead to the ship and we sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board. For so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he met, a, met us at Assos, we took him on board and we came to Mytilene. They were going to take him on, on, a, on a boat. Paul decided to, to, to walk the distance instead, the 20 miles, instead of, of going with them on the boat. He went on foot, met up with them. Then he got on the boat, and then they came to Mytilene. Mytilene is south of Assos. It's a little island, a city on an island called Lesbos. It says, we sailed from there, verse 15, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. So they're making their way around uh, this uh, area. And uh, this is in, um, Miletus is in Asia Minor, about 30 miles south of Ephesus. It's interesting that Chios is, uh, we're told, is the birthplace of the poet Homer. And uh, Samos is uh, the place where uh, Pythagoras of the Pythagorean theorem uh, was born in this area. So you're, you're getting into some really deep, rich Greek history here where Paul uh, is traveling and ministering and speaking. Paul is still trying to get to Jerusalem, and he's still trying to make it on time uh, for the Feast of Pentecost. Verse 16 for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church. So Paul does not want to spend the time to travel the 30 miles to go back to Ephesus, but he does want to give a farewell message to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. Remember, Paul was in Ephesus longer, really, than, than anywhere else that we know of. He was there for three years, pastoring and ministering in the city of Ephesus. And so before Paul departed to Jerusalem, he had a meeting. He called the leaders, the elders, the overseers, the pastors, the under-shepherds from the church of Ephesus to come 
and meet him there in Miletus. Verse 18. When they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. So Paul is referencing his character and nature and reminding them uh, of his character. And, and he says, you know that I was humble uh, when I was among you. And humility really is the character of Jesus Christ. It's the nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us that of himself. He says, learn from me in Matthew chapter 11, for I am meek and lowly and humble of heart. And so uh, humility is the goal, really. Humility for the Christian is, is the chief ambition. Uh, not uh, anything other than humility. Unfortunately, many people uh, that are religious or many people uh, who are in positions of authority in the church often are the opposite of humble, aren't they? They're very arrogant. They're very prideful uh, about themselves, even about their titles. They call themselves the reverend, as though you should treat them with reverence, like they should be revered, the reverend so-and-so, uh, instead of just uh, the humility uh, as Jesus modeled for us, as, as Paul models for us. Pastor Chuck Smith was my pastor. Uh, he ordained me into the ministry down at Calvary Costa Mesa in November of 2006, and I had the privilege of knowing Chuck and his family very, very well. I'm still very, very close friends with his son, Jeff Smith. I'm really hoping Jeff and his daughter will join us on our trip to Israel. He's considering it. Um, Chuck was one of the humblest people I've ever known. He probably was the humblest man I've ever known. And yet he was the most powerful expositor, the most brilliant uh, teacher, Bible teacher of, of the last century, in my opinion. And yet he was so humble. Uh, you would never know it if, if you ran into him somewhere, that he was so famous and he was you know, such an important uh, part and member of the body of Christ. It's what defined him, what was humility, not pride, not arrogance, not uh, self-confidence, not ego. Uh, and many will say that about Billy Graham. I, I never had the privilege of meeting Billy Graham, but anyone, my grandfather met Billy Graham on a couple of occasions when my grandfather was uh, the mayor of Anaheim and, and chairman of the board of supervisors for, for Orange County. He had the privilege of meeting Billy Graham uh, on a couple of occasions and even having a meal with him. And he said, even though my, my grandfather was diehard Irish Catholic, he said that he was almost convinced to become a Christian just because of the uh, pull uh, of the humility of Billy Graham, that Billy Graham was such a godly, humble, unassuming man, and he was such a powerful man. God used him in such a mighty, powerful way, and yet he was a complete, uh, humble man in character and nature. Again, it's very sad when pastors are so arrogant and prideful, and they think so highly of themselves as though they are something, instead of remembering, really, that they're just supposed to be the chief servant, because Jesus said, the greatest among you shall be the servant of all. So he tells him, I've served the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials. Again, he didn't have it easy. He suffered per, pros, uh, persecution and difficulties and uh, attempts on his life uh, many times. He says, what's happened to me by the plotting of the Jews? How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. And that is a, a good sign of a good pastor. They don't hold anything back. They give you the, the whole word of God, the whole counsel of God. As a matter of fact, Paul says this in verse 26, skipping ahead a little bit. He says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. That's what you want from a pastor. If you ever come in here and I'm just talking about myself and I'm just telling you my home movies and how it was when I was five and what my dog ate for dinner last Sunday or last night or you know where my kids went on vacation or wh whatever, and all I'm doing is talking about myself, you need to find another church and go find a pastor that's going to teach you the word of God. That's what you should be looking for in a pastor, in a Bible teacher. Someone who's going to teach you God's word. It's not about me. You don't need to know about me and my life and my story. I don't talk about myself very often for that reason. I have a testimony. I have a very interesting testimony, people tell me. But you're not here to hear about me. You're here to hear about Jesus. And I'm here to give you God's word, not my words, not my word. 
There's churches that put one verse up and they spend 45 minutes talking about themselves and telling funny stories, uh, you know, jokes and all the rest, make you feel good about yourself and send you on your way and you didn't learn anything about God, Jesus, or the Bible. And so uh, Paul says, I, I, I'm not that guy. Paul says, I, I, I was here. I, I held back nothing to you that was helpful. Even the tough stuff is helpful to us because uh, we, we need the tough stuff. We need to know the truth so that we can stay in, in a right position before God. And we could properly represent God to a lost and fallen and broken and dying world. And Paul says, I've sh not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I didn't cherry pick I didn't jump around the controversial subjects. I taught you that homosexuality is a sin and that those who practice homosexuality uh, are not going to go to heaven. I, I told you that, that, that those who uh, say that marriage is not between one man and one woman <clears throat> is a heretical blasphemous doctrine and, and that marriage is only between one man and one woman that fornicators God will judge, that those who practice witchcraft and, uh, and the occult are not going to go to heaven. I mean, Paul didn't hold back anything. You read his letters, you read his epistles. Paul told them the truth. Even as Jesus uh, told his followers and his hearers the truth. He says, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you. And I taught you publicly. He says, I wasn't teaching you in, in hiding. We weren't hiding in some bunker somewhere or, you know, some, some secret place where we had our secret gatherings and it was all secret. He says, no, I was preaching out there in the streets, telling everybody the truth of Jesus Christ. I taught you publicly and from house to house. Most Bible scholars believe that the churches began in houses, we see it many times mentioned in the scriptures that they didn't necessarily have big buildings with a cross on top of them. They met in houses. And the church was a house church. It was a home church movement. And there's many men of God that have said that the church started in houses. And uh, right before the last days, when we get up to the time prior to the rapture of the church and the coming of the Antichrist, the church is going to go back underground and go back into the houses because it's not going to be tolerated uh, in the public square. And I could see how easily we could end up there. He says in verse 21, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance. There's so many churches that won't mention the word repent because they won't mention the word sin because they don't want to offend people. Then how could people get saved if they don't hear the gospel? And the gospel is that you're a sinner and you're helplessly enslaved to the sins of your flesh and apart from salvation through the grace of Jesus Christ and being born again by the Spirit of God, you're going to go to hell. But they don't talk about sin because it offends. They don't talk about repentance because it offends. They don't want you to mention the word hell because it offends. They don't teach about the cross, how Jesus suffered and died on the cross because then they'd have to tell you that they, he suffered and died for your sins. They don't teach these things because they want to keep their churches large and they want to have more people there giving more money instead of telling people the truth. And so instead of feeding the sheep, they're entertaining the goats. The people aren't even saved because they don't even know how to be saved. No one's preached the gospel to them. Paul says, testifying to Jews and to Greeks, repentance toward God, turning from our sin and falling on our face before the Lord, repenting of our sins and, and changing our course and following the Lord. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem. It was within him. He had to go back to Jerusalem. But he also knew uh, that when he got there, chains and imprisonment and tribulations were going to await him. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. We will read that as we get on uh, with the story uh, in Acts chapter 21 and, and, and further in the book of Acts. And we see that's exactly right. Chains and tribulations awaited him. But he still wasn't going to stop his course. He was still going to continue to go uh, right where God wanted him to be, even though there were storm clouds on the horizon for Paul the Apostle. He says, verse 24, concerning troubles and chains, imprisonment and tribulations that await him. He says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself 
so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. None of these things move me. He was not going to be moved. Uh, he was going to continue to push ahead, press ahead in serving the Lord, in fulfilling his mission, fulfilling his ministry. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20, he said, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my, la from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and go to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul's like, I'm ready to get to heaven. I'm ready to be there with the golden gates and to, and to be there at the feet of Jesus. To have that great family reunion with all the saints, the Old Testament and New Testament saints of the faith. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more crying, no more sickness, no more pain, no more death. All the old things are passed away and all things have become new. The curse is reversed. And Paul says, I would rather be there, but it's necessary for your sakes that I'm here. And so I'll continue to serve and I'll continue to teach and I'll continue to fulfill and complete my mission that God has given to me. But he says, uh, um, I uh, would prefer a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Remember that Paul records for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he actually had an experience where he went to heaven and he saw the third heaven and he came back and he lived to tell about it. And that's when he received the thorn in the flesh, uh, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. And he says, I prayed three times that God would remove the thorn from my flesh. But God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. In weakness, my strength is made perfect. So Paul says, therefore, I will boast in my weaknesses, in my infirmities, in my suffering, in my persecutions. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. He also said that he was uh, going to finish his race in, in 2 Timothy, which is actually the last epistle, the last letter that Paul wrote, and actually the last verses uh, of that last epistle. Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. These are practically the last words that Paul the Apostle pinned. He knew that he was about to be killed. He was going to be beheaded. He was beheaded by Emperor Nero in Rome in uh, somewhere around 65 or 66 AD. So he says, my race is finished. I've, I've completed my task. My mission is done. I'm ready to go to glory. I'm ready to depart. And it's interesting. He talks about that he was going to be made a drink offering uh, in that his head was going to be chopped off and all of his blood would be poured out. And he saw that as an offering of his life unto God. Back in Acts chapter 20, verse 25, he says, And indeed, now I know that, and indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify you this day, testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And by the way, that's why we go chapter and chapter, verse by verse through the Bible at every Calvary Chapel, at least every true Calvary Chapel, because that's what Pastor Chuck taught us. That's what we learned from him. And that way we could say, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. You stick around long enough, and if the Lord should tarry, we're going to get through the entire Bible, uh, one verse at a time, one chapter at a time, one book at a time. He says in verse 28, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own 
blood. Interesting here, the blood of Jesus is the blood of God. One of the scriptures that you could show the Jehovah's Witnesses when they come knocking on your door to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. He says, take heed to yourselves, to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased, God, with his own blood. Because the blood of Jesus is the blood of God. Jesus says, I will build my church. It's, it's his church. It's not our church. It's his church. I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail uh, against it. We're just overseers, even as pastors, as elders. We are overseers of his work, of his sheep. You're not my sheep. You're his sheep. And I'm to love and feed the sheep. That's the command that's given to the shepherd, to the under-shepherd of the pastor. He says, for I know this, verse 29, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul is warning them exactly as Jesus had warned his disciples earlier of the wolves in sheep's clothing. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, Jesus says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. That's their words, their deeds, their actions. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus warned against the false prophets who come as wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus also told his disciples, in Luke and chapter 10 and verse 3, he says, Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. The wolves are there and the wolves eat sheep. Wolves feed on sheep. They try and draw disciples unto themselves. That's why the, the cults are wolves in sheep's clothing because they're drawing people away from the truth and they're drawing them unto themselves. Uh, goats eat trash so non-believers the bible calls goats on the left hand they eat trash they have no interest in feeding on the word of god sheep feed on the word sheep feed on the the, the life uh, of, of the manna from heaven the word of god that's where we find our our daily bread is in the word of god goats have no interest in the word of god they're worldly they want trash they feed on trash and wolves are the most dangerous kind because they come in to the flock and they are dressed up like sheep, they talk like sheep, they act like sheep, but they really are wolves and they begin to draw disciples after themselves. And so Paul warns us about the wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus warns us about the wolves in sheep's clothing. In 1 Timothy in chapter 6, Paul the Apostle said this in verse 3, he says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words for which come envy, strife, uh, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourselves the name it and claim it uh, heretical theology that God wants you uh, to be rich and to drive a brand new car and live in the biggest mansion and have a million dollars in your bank account that's not true for most of us most of us 
God does not want us to have a million dollars in our bank account or drive the fanciest car or have the most expensive house in the neighborhood. Perhaps there's a few in the body uh, that God, and they're going to have to be good stewards of that, and they're going to have to answer to God for what they did with all that money. Uh, but for most of us, that's, that's not what God's calling us to. So it is a heretical doctrine when people tell you, uh, if you name it, you can claim it. If you blab it, you can grab it, that God wants you to be rich and famous and, and, and have every material possession that you could possibly uh, imagine. It's, it's not scriptural. Even Jesus says, I, uh, birds have nests and foxes have dens and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus owned nothing. Uh, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk when he took the lame man and raised him up to hell. They had no money, no silver, no gold. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That's what a true shepherd, a true pastor is commanded to do. Verse 3 of 2 Timothy 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Literally, they're going to tell people what the people want to hear. They're false teachers, they're false prophets, he says, because they're not telling people the truth, they're just telling people what they want. To hear, And oftentimes it's the, the things that uh, we need to hear aren't necessarily things we want to hear, but it's the truth and we need to hear the truth. There are so many churches and, and so many ministries that are just way out in left field. It's hard to even know uh, where to start. But because we're, we're talking about this, I, I want to just share with you a couple uh, of, of articles here quickly. So this is, uh, this is an article uh, regarding Pope Francis, and this is uh, written from Michael Haynes on the LifeSite News, which is actually a Catholic news agency, uh, written on March 17, 2023. And this is what he says about the Pope and his statement in denying the existence of hell. In an interview to mark his 10-year anniversary, Pope Francis appeared to deny the existence of hell saying that, quote, it is not a place, unquote, but is instead simply a, quote, state of the heart and a posture towards life, unquote. The pontiff's comments formed part of a lengthy conversation conducted by Argentinian news site Perfil, one of a number of recent interviews the Pope granted journalists to mark his decade upon the papal throne. Touching on a number of topics he discussed with other reporters, Francis also spoke about his philosophical and theological thought, along with aspects relating to global politics. As part of the in-depth discussion, Francis was asked, what is your own interpretation of hell and paradise? And what happens to people who go to hell? And what happens to those who go to paradise? Given a, giving a trademark lengthy, convoluted, and somewhat evasive answer, Francis appeared to deny the existence of hell as an actual place. Hell is not a place, he said. If one goes to attend the last judgment and sees the faces of those who go to hell, one gets scared. If you read Dante, you get scared. But these are merely media representations. Expanding on his answer, Francis described hell as simply a state, a description which appeared to refer to a state of mind. Hell is a state. There are people who live in hell continuously. He goes on to say people are living in hell right now because it's a state of mind. Even the head of the Roman Catholic Church does no longer believe in a place, in the existence of a place called hell. Uh, another article here, and this is uh, from Christian Concern, dated March 25th, 2023. Bible College fires theologian for a tweet defending biblical sexuality. A Christian, lecture, uh, a Christian theology lecturer with five young children has been sacked and threatened with a counterterrorism referral by a Methodist Bible college for a tweet on human sexuality that went viral. Dr. Aaron Edwards, 37, who was being supported by the Christian Legal Center, was last week sacked for misconduct by Cliff College in Derbyshire for allegedly 
bringing the college into disrepute on social media. Dr. Edwards was threatened with being reported to prevent, interrogated on how he would pray for same-sex attracted students who approach him for prayer, and believes as a result of the sacking and subsequent controversy that he might not be able to work in the UK higher education again. Dr. Edwards has said, anyone concerned about academic freedom, Christian freedoms, and free speech should be deeply concerned by what has happened to me. The story is a microcosm of the fallout in the Methodist Church in Britain following a June 2021 decision by its governing body to allow same-sex marriages in places of worship. The Methodist Church globally has traditionally understood that marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others and the only appropriate context for sexual intimacy. Since the vote, however, Methodist Church leaders and members have found themselves in the impossible position of being compelled to affirm same-sex marriage while also to continue to teach the biblical belief that homosexual practice is sinful. Increasingly, under the banner of tolerance and kindness, conservative evangelical Christians, especially in the Methodist Church and Church of England, are unable to hold or express biblical teaching which does not affirm LGBT ideology without fear of reprisals. This has included being labeled homophobic, homophobic being reported as safeguarding risks and even being referred to the government's counterterrorism watchdog prevent for holding allegedly extreme views. This is this is in, in, in England, in the UK. And then one more article here, and, and the this is uh, this is all from the Prophecy uh, Newswatch site. This is an article from the Prophecy Newswatch staff dated April 22nd, 2023. And it says, Blasphemous Easter production ignites debate over artistic license in church. It's not the first time Pastor Michael Todd's mega church in Tulsa, Oklahoma has come under fire for controversial actions, but his transformation church service for Easter earlier this month has reignited the debate about how far creativity and art can go in the church without crossing a line that should not be crossed. The musical performance of the resurrection of Jesus called Ransom was put on by the church for Easter services on April 8th and 9th. Todd claims the artistic performance was to show how God's love conquered sin, death, and the grave, and points to 500 people who gave their lives to Christ after the services as justification for its questionable presentation, which, according to Todd, go right to the edge and do everything short of sin in order to reach people. This type of worldview thinking appears to be working as they have a following of almost 2 million YouTube subscribers. However, those who have seen clips of the performance online have other words to describe it, including demonic, irreverent, and blasphemous. Todd has previously come under scrutiny for crowd surfing during his church's worship service and spending a lot of money. In the last two years, he's given away $3.5 million in houses, cash, and cars, spent $65,000 to buy 168 pairs of tennis shoes, and gave $600,000 in reparations and purchased a six, $66 million of real estate. He cuddled a mannequin in bed on stage while preaching about relationships. Let me read that again. He cuddled a mannequin in bed on stage. In the middle of his church service, he had his bed set up with a mannequin and he cuddled a mannequin in bed on stage while preaching about relationships and his church recently hired disgraced former Hillsong pastor Carl Lentz who has yet to come clean on all the details regarding his extramarital affairs while pastoring such stars as Justin Bieber. He's also known for giving the world perhaps the grossest modern illustration in church. I don't even know if I want to read this to you. After he snorted and hawked a loogie full of spit and snot into his hand and rubbed it into another man's face. The ransom Easter service, which ran for over two hours and featured dozens of dancers in tight outfits, a light show, pyrotechnics, flames, demon characters, dry eyes, suggestive secular music, and a female representing Jesus Christ on the cross, 
The production used songs from pop stars such as Keisha, Beyonce, and Justin Timberlake, sometimes with lyric changes. In one skit, performers talked about the size of their rear ends. During another part of the show, a singer wore trendy and very expensive red boots and rapped, I've been getting the money, everybody mad. And perhaps you've seen the clips. They spent a lot of time in hell in that Easter resurrection service. They did a whole scene of hell with the devil. And again, they have Jesus as a woman. I think it was a black woman actually hanging on the cross. So Paul warns there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing that are going to come into the flock. Uh, and, and I believe that we are living in those last days where people uh, really don't have any tolerance or appetite for the word of God. They just want their ears to be tickled and they want to get as close to the edge without actually falling uh, off into hell. Again, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. It literally broke the heart of Paul because this breaks the heart of God. Verse 32, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Romans 8 talks about our inheritance that we have in Christ uh, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the wonderful, in Ephesians 2, the wonderful inheritance that we have in Christ. He says, I have coveted no one's silver, gold, or apparel. I wasn't here to get rich. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. He literally worked with his own hands so that nobody could accuse him of being there for the money. He says, I've shown you in every way, verse 35, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. And indeed, they did not see his face again after this because uh, he would not... Uh, be able to travel freely after this. When he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested and he's going to be bound in chains from that point on for the rest of his life, in chains for the, for, the, for the gospel, in chains for the cause of Christ. So much to be aware of, to be wary of, to be careful uh, of in our culture, in our world today. And not everyone that claims to be a Christian is a Christian. Not everyone who claims to be a pastor is, is a true pastor. We have to be discerning. We have to have discernment. We have to test all things. You test everything I say by the word of God. By any, anyone that anybody claims to be speaking for God, test it. Check it with the word and make sure it lines up. Test all things and hold fast to that which is true, the scriptures say. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us your word by which we could test all things, Lord. And we could hold fast to that which is true. We thank you, Father, for giving us your spirit, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of discernment, Lord, to give us discernment, Lord God, about these false prophets and these false teachers and these wolves in sheep's clothing that are just enriching themselves by fleecing the flock of God. Lord, we thank you that you modeled humility and poverty for us, Lord, so that we would understand, Lord, that, that we should be okay at, with humility and poverty, that that even uh, is, is something to aspire towards, Lord God, the opposite of what this world says. Not that you call us to give everything away uh, that would not be practical, but, Lord, that we're not to be here to lay up treasures on the earth and to accumulate as much wealth as possible in this life, Lord. Really, the best way for us to deal with money is to Give it away to send it ahead, Lord God, and to lay up our treasures in heaven. We thank you, Father, for this church. We thank you for all the great men and women of God here at Calvary Visalia. We ask you continue to protect us from the attacks of the enemy, Father. Continue to watch over us and guard us, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.